Welcome back to the second session of this morning, to the panel discussion on fair culture, preconditions for music as a tool for social change. Um, we're very happy to have gathered so many speakers from really all over the world. And we're also especially happy that Hanne Leleto from the Finnish Ministry of Education and Culture will chair this session because she also uh, actually is the author of the paper on fair culture. And Hannele will uh, introduce to you the concept of fair culture. So, um, but before that, I would like to invite already all speakers on stage so that um, during all your presentations you will sit on the stage so that uh, you have the joint stage feeling already just from the beginning. And the speakers are um, Luisa Jorge from the Dominican Republic, uh, Ahmad Sarmas from Afghanistan, Rem Kasim from Egypt, Feti Zgonda from Tunisia, Arne Saluwe from Estonia, and Brett Piper from South Africa. And of course, Hanne Leletu, um, introducing, starting with the concept of fair culture. Thank you very much. so much. It's really a great pleasure being here today uh, and I'm especially grateful for the organizers for choosing this kind of topic for this uh, conference uh, because I have been working with this concept and this idea of fair culture more than a decade now and when I started uh, in the end of 19th, it was not fashionable at all. But we can see that nowadays these uh, issues are more and more actual all over the world. And also in Europe, we have seen uh, that kind of development, uh, even we in Finland, uh, which uh, uh, in, in which uh, this kind of concept can be very useful, a useful tool for uh, discussing uh, multiculturalism and uh, several other issues, uh, polarization between people and these kind of things, uh, which are uh, all, all the time more and more difficult all over the world. Um, first, I can tell you something I have done with cultural industry and uh, culture uh, in the Ministry of Education. Uh, because when uh, uh, here was uh, the idea of how dangerous can be the concept of uh, creative industries, it really can. And I started with uh, that concept in the end of 19th and uh, sometimes when I look around I think that it's a little bit like Oppenheimer feeling. <laughs> that kind of uh, concept uh, can be used so many ways. Uh, but I started uh, with cultural industries and after that I have uh, done a plan for the World Bank uh, they asked me to do a criteria for uh, creative industries uh, and supporting creative industries in developing countries. Uh, it was in, in the year 2000, uh, cultural industry and sustainable development and how to make best practices in promoting sustainable cultural production in developed countries. And that's uh, the way I came into this topic of fair culture and cultural sustainable production. And uh, then I made a cultural exportation project in the ministry and um, after that uh, we developed uh, 
a satellite of cultural accounts, uh, we tried to invent some kind uh, indicators of some way of evaluating the impact of culture in uh, national accounts. And that's a way which has been very important in Finland. And it has had also impact in our politics as a whole, I think. But now I'd like to ask who knows what's this? No idea? This is something we can start the idea of fair culture. And um, this is the piece of art uh, made by Marta de Menezes, uh, bio artist, Portuguese bio artist. And uh, she made a work which, as a whole, is called The Family. And uh, this piece of that is called The Extended Family. And in this, uh, she has uh, applied a scientific uh, method uh, how to make DNA microarrays to illustrate how much uh, human beings and uh, fruit fly have in common in their DNA. And it's actually it's, uh, about 30%. And with that, she tries to illustrate that all living creatures are all the same, so that our extended family is not only the humankind or mankind, but it's the same li life which is in all the nature. And that's why it's so important to have this sustainability in all our actions. And this is the installation. There was that kind of uh, uh, cubic, plastic cubic, uh, in which people could compare the zebra fish and human DNA and fruit fly and uh, human DNA. But the other piece of that work is the nuclear family. And this was put in the same kind of exhibition. And here she is uh, combining DNA of different human groups, so that she has collected human uh, DNA uh, examples. And in this uh, interpretation, in, the, in this piece of art, you have to come to the conclusion that there, are, there is no, no difference whatsoever between different groups of people. Uh, black or white or brown eyes or blue eyes or whatever groups we have in our society. And uh, so we can here see very clearly that, for instance, the concept of race has no scientific uh, evidence. But then fair culture, ethics of cultural policy, I started this research project in the year 2005, and uh, the objective was to outline the ethics and ethical dimensions of cultural policy with cultural rights as a starting point. And uh, this concept and discourse analysis of documents connected with cultural policy, treaties, conventions, declarations, legislation, and other norms especially related to UNESCO, EU, and the Council of Europe, uh, and United Nations, and so on. So uh, we try to find uh, which is uh, the basement of fair culture and what kind of cultural rights we can uh, define as universal uh, human rights. And it was really very interesting uh, project and uh, we defined the concept fair culture so that it means the reali realization of cultural rights 
and the inclusion of everyone in cultural signification, irrespective of their age, gender, disability, or ethnic, religious, and cultural background. And uh, actually, here in Radisson Hotel, in my hotel room, there's a mirror. And in that mirror, there is uh, printed John Lennon's uh, words to John Lennon's piece, Imagine. Imagine all the people living life in peace. And I read it very closely yesterday when I came. And I thought that what kind of dimensions do this have to our conference and the content of fair culture? And actually, it was a little bit odd to analyze that uh, word by word. But anyway, uh, we live the time when John Lennon's imagine is printed to decorate a Radisson uh, change mirror. <laughs> yeah, that's cultural industry. Cultural rights, they are very underdeveloped part of human rights. Uh, they have not received attention they needed, not as much as other human rights, but they are essential to the identity, integrity, and dignity of peoples. And uh, there's a direct correlation with cultural dimension and humor, human rights as well. But they lack any monitoring system, and uh, violations of human rights, they always have also a cultural impact. And in our politics nowadays, we can see that these two things, cultural rights and human rights, uh, as a whole, they are very deeply uh, connected with each other in all the news in the world. And that's why it's even more important to bring them to agenda more widely. Key principles of cultural rights, autonomy and intrinsic value of art and culture, diversity. Uh, I prefer the term pluralism or multiculturalism to diversity because diversity it emphasizes something, the etymology of this uh, word is from different, different and diverse. And I, I don't think that's a good <laughs> starting point. We should start talking multiculturalism or variations or something like that instead of diversity. And non-discrimination, access to the tradition of humankind and our, um, everyone's own cultural sphere, human dignity, tradition, identity, equality, democracy, uh, access, accessibility, inclusion, and participation in culture, freedom of choice, self-determination, fair deals, the diversity and matching of cultural provision, because uh, especially young artists, they are not treated fairly. Uh, even we are speaking of copyright issues and so on. It's not as simple as it is all, all very often in our speech. It's more complex because there's only always this kind of uh, position of young and not so strong. Uh, artist to make agreements and so on. Capability for cultural self-expression and signification, which is uh, in connection with our education, our basic education in our countries. And in Nordic countries, we have a concept of everyone's right. And it means that everyone, everyone has right to pick uh, mushrooms or berries anywhere, no matter who possesses uh, the land or 
forest or anything. Everyone's right, and it's very important in, in Nordic countries. And I think that our goal should be to make uh, cultural rights to everyone's rights all over the world. And I think this five music rights, uh, which is the goal of this uh, conference, is a very good starting point in that sense. Here I have analyzed uh, in the basis of uh, classical Aristotle uh, uh, division of um, ethical dimensions, ethical choices in cultural policy, virtue ethic, freedom ethos, responsibility ethic, rights ethos, or consequential ethic, benefit ethos, so that the freedom of art is autonomy, intrinsic value, self-expression, individual creative identity, and responsibility uh, includes uh, realization of cultural rights, cultural tradition, and our cultural identity. And benefits is creativity as a means, not only for commercial purposes, but also applications for health and social care, and uh, social applications, and so on. And uh, these things are more closely uh, analyzed in that fair culture publication. I don't go very deep there. Uh, in creativity, we have certain cycles. Uh, always first this kind of experimental, playing, critical, avant-garde uh, way of doing art. And sort cycles, new concepts, but also these kind of uh, long cycles, traditional cultural heritage, from which we always get more uh, material for everything new in the art. And then practical applic applications, uh, produc production and making products, creative industries, which is also important for uh, getting uh, art to everyone because it's the way of uh, making things uh, copied for many people. I think uh, the uh, illness we have suffered from uh, last decades is a kind of innovation fever, inflationary spiral of innovation, and it's all also being called innoflation. Uh, and I think uh, this kind of uh, economical and commercial uh, way of looking at art has been too dominant and we needed more deep and uh, more going more into the old tradition slowly, not only that kind of very quick uh, profits but also this kind of social, slow uh, development living together. And uh, I think that fair culture could be also a very strong competitive factor. This <laughs> slide is made for politicians. <laughs> In the future, these kind of things will also guide consumer choices. And we can see it now. Uh, ethical issues have been become more and more uh, important also all over the world and in people's choices. Equality, it's not uh, only for political speech uh, during election, but it also has a deeper meaning. But we needed uh, some kind of indicators of how important these things are. Because we have indicators for economic dimension, cross-national product, which is applied all over as if it could illustrate everything. And uh, human uh, well-being, which, which is not the case. 
And there's also other indexes like social dimension, so human development index, human well-being index, and ecological dimension, environmental uh, indexes, and so on. But cultural dimension, cultural diversity, cultural multiculturalism, and so on, they have not been studied so much. And, and we have no that kind of uh, long-term uh, evaluation of the impact here. And, and here's something we need to be done. Uh, ethical assessment in cultural policy, it may mean that we make different alternatives and ethically conflicting interests visible and understanding them. And we raise awareness of consequences of different choices and create indicators for measuring ethical dimension and realization of cultural rights. And uh, to, the, uh, to include, I would like to uh, show you three pictures. Uh, this is uh, the piece of art, Hugo Simberg, The Wounded Angel, which was uh, painted uh, 1903. And it was voted the most popular uh, piece of art in Finland uh, some years ago. And uh, definitely is uh, most beloved uh, icon of our I Finnish identity. Uh, it was painted uh, at the time when our country was very, very poor, developing country, and very deeply polarized nation, rich and poor people. And very soon after this, we had a severe civil war. So somehow, this, also this picture, uh, it's, it's symbolistic, and uh, it has been interpreted in many ways, and also we have very many applications also in advertising and so on. But in 80s, Pekka Vuori made this kind of <laughs> version of it. And I like this very much because I think that it shows very clearly, clearly what we can do with culture. <laughs> we can free our souls. <laughs> and how we do that is, is here. It's Hannes Heikura's photo of the year 2001. Christmas angels. <laughs> it was uh, this photo was taken uh, in Helsinki <laughs> in December. It's very dark and and <laughs> and gloom and and so on. But these uh, everyday angels, they are doing something good. Uh, and we have in Finland a saying, a proverb saying, "Ollaan ihmisiksi." Let's act like human beings, and I think that's what fair culture is all about. And I'd like to add, uh, let's imagine, imagine all the people <laughs> would act like human beings. And uh, fair culture, uh, this uh, publication is available in Finnish and Swedish and uh, English uh, over the net. And here is more analysis of, of these concepts and, and detailed uh, information. But after that, uh, we have also made in, in Finland uh, a report for parliament uh, for the future. It was given uh, by government to parliament, culture, future force. And here, one starting point is fair culture. And, fair cuts and, and when we speak about indicators, here is one indicator which is stronger than any other indicator when we discuss arts. I can see it in your eyes. There's no stronger way to see the impact of art. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, six uh, people, and every, everyone could uh, speak about seven minutes, and then we give three minutes for the audience <laughs> for questions to just this uh, person. And after that, we have uh, more this, uh, time for discussion, uh, about half an hour, I think. 
so that we can, can discuss all the details and, and issues and so on. But uh, the first, just for the lecture. And we start with Luisa Hors. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, Luisa is a strong advocate for poorest people uh, in Hispaniola, conducting dozens of initiatives in the areas of health, education, community development, ecotourism, micro, micro business, alphabetization, and uh, alimentary security. And in recent years, she has added music to her efforts, implementing in the, the Philharmonia Foundation and producing festivals and educational programs that touch thousands of families who have regained hope for the future. Thank you. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is our reality in Caribbean, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. <clears throat> How music can be a, a tool for social change in Dominican Republic and Haiti. <clears throat> Present conditions. Haiti and Dominican Republic, two nations in one island, both living in very high levels of poverty, two languages and two different realities. As the poorest country of the American continent, Haiti <coughs> is facing its greatest challenge after being devastated by a very powerful earthquake that destroyed most of the infrastructure, mainly in the capital, Puerto Principe. A slow growth make, makes Haiti's economic perspective played, facing 0% job creation, growth, and depending on international aid for more than 50% of their annual budget and 40% of money sent by Haitians national living abroad. Employing is over 70% will 80% of the population live below poverty. Poverty labors. Half a 10 million Haitians still depend on agriculture to cover their primary needs. The music 
is the perfect language to communicate, to live in harmony and peace. The music is a powerful tool for social change. The Haiti and Dominican Republic have a two different languages, two different religions, and two different cultures, and live together in the front end, and work together. And music is in the instrument it change your life in, the rea in your reality, in the reality. New, po new possibilities implementing arts and means of social development. Venezuela has given the model that has revolutionized the role of music education and its influence in precarious economic conditions, bringing new hope to the utterly poor through the means of a new aesthetic vision. For more than 30 years, the Sistema, as it is called around the globe, has become the formula to follow for many Latin American countries that have introduced its principles to effectively fight against violence and never-ending culture of poverty. Founded by Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu, the moving the movement has systematized the instruction and practice of music through the collectivation of an art that was exclusively for the upper classes, using the orchestras and the chorus as instruments of social development and virtual laboratories for community improvement. Tomorrow, uh, the Puerto Rico has a conference on the Sistema um, uh, because now and only speak the model is Philharmonic based on uh, your instruction. This model has renewed hope for impoverished countries like Haiti in the Dominican Republic and is the platform in which the Philharmonic Foundation has established and launched its initiative to discover and develop new values and skills among the forgetting and the needy, giving them options to move away from a world of violence, crime, drugs addiction, and trafficking, transforming them in wholesome individuals that will bear. Contribute to their own destiny and to the future of the nations with the assurance of a better world. Actions, corresponding actions. In 2005, inspired by Venezuela Modern, our foundation launched, launched the Areitos program, Artists for Social Development, the first of kind in the Hispaniola Island with a growth of musicians from Spain acting as volunteers, working in place with very difficult conditions and showing dramatic results in only three months and a drastic change in their attitude and great development in their interpersonal skills. Better school grades and a capacity to dream have high above their pressing limitations and conditions. We have an investi investigation about the impact of model in their uh, children. More than 2,500 children and youngsters have been touched by the Philharmonic Foundation program, and countless family and community, most of them living in the batalles, comprised of both Haitians and Dominicans place where the sugar cane workers live in very precarious conditions and that can now share the joy of making music together, thus easing the perils of lack of proper health, education, and alimentary conditions. Challenge and the future. Our goal and aim is to have binational orchestra June ensembles uh, all along the border of both countries creating a culture of mutual understanding and respect, sharing the dignity 
once denied by critical living condition. We trust that our efforts will be emulated in other areas of these countries and that many groups will be modeled after our experience. Attracting other organizations to include the studies of music in their efforts. Channeling funds from abroad, bringing musicians from all over the world and making available instruments, scores, and all logistical needs for the production of concerts, festivals, and music camps that will literally fill the regions with music. In, in November, we are the first festival a binational country. We also advise government officers embracing the core values of our program by establishing similar programs at the public school system so that we can also influence them and accompany them in their efforts by giving them all the assistance necessary to successfully create new space for the practice of symphonic music and their systems. The Caribbean is one of the most soft as their place in the world because of its natural exuberance, beautiful beaches, and world people. These characteristics can be decisive to attract dozens of thousands of musicians that will give freely of their time, talents, and experience to come and train local instructors so that we can have an exponential multipli multiplying force that will eventually grow into the music centers that will service the noble musicians. Later, later on, our foundation will scout the most promising of dedicated talents so that they can future under our music musical studies in the most important learning institutions like the Dominican National Conservatory and the National University, and encouraging them the forces professional careers in music, facilitating a scholarship for master program abroad. It is quite possible that local communities may become interested in sponsoring some of the new creative ensembles, thus creating new job opportunities for the most advanced players and serving their villas and towns for special events and celebration. More than means, we need a firm determination to bring about these wonderful dreams into reality. Inspiration comes also through transpiration, and many people are waiting for projects like this to spring to bring a more transcending experience to their artist career. There are countless musicians that have played the repertoire over and over to learned audience that are looking for new ears and new hairs to listen to their music. This will bring great satisfaction to them and sense of deep fulfillment that the applause of the best reviews could never achieve. A chain reactions will follow, and similar ventures will open up in, the, in other need areas of the globe, making the world a better place and giving the music of the great masters a brand new reasons to keep resounding outside the words of the most renowned music hall, accompanying the clothes in the sky and bringing a piece of heaven to so many lives and will never be seen again, resounding their hearts and harmony with the tempo of eternity. We invite all of you to consider giving music a new dimension by adding to it the social action element that has changed thousands in the street of Harlem, in the jungles of Sun America. Give out your score, your almost new string and treats, but most of your time and knowledge that once brought you the unspeakable joy to those who are waiting for the music of the angels to accompany their journey through love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luisa.
for very inspiring examples. <laughs> and uh, now you have a few questions. Uh, opportunity to... Okay, we can continue. And uh, there is one here. Okay. Oh, here is... Oh, you have already. So thank you for very interesting presentation. Uh, just one question. Uh, do you have uh, in your program also uh, traditional music, folk music of uh, Dominican Republic, or is it only for classical music? All music. And the base is mus traditional music. It's the first. And later, uh, music, uh, universal music, and classic. OK, please. It's not a question, it's an expression. <laughs> Thank you very much. More expressions? <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, our next speaker uh, is Ahmad Sarmast. Please, Ahmad. Uh, who is an Afghan native and uh, son of pioneering musician Ukta Ustad Sarmat. Uh, he studied at Moscow State Conservatorium and received his PhD from Monash University from Australia, where he later joined as a research fellow. Uh, he has researched uh, Afghan music since uh, 1993, resulting in a landmark book on that subject. And so please, Ahmad. The floor is yours. You come. You come. It's from the other side. Yeah. Just a minute, please. <laughs> <laughs> More questions when we are waiting. <laughs> or expressions. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. You, you, you can press the button. Yes, somewhere. Okay. No. It's not during the conference. Perhaps you can change the picture. Like uh, something with that yeah, function. Five. Function 5. But you don't. Try it again. It's coming. It's coming. I just, just try it. There's time for questions if you want okay. to continue. Yeah, finally. Thank you very much for this invitation to talk here about how we are implementing or how we use music in post-Taliban in a war-torn country to bring about social changes. Uh, knowing that I've got only seven minutes to talk about a very big and a very broad issue, 
Uh, I'm not going to get involved here in a very deep theoretical or philosophical uh, discussion. Uh, I will be showing two short video clips which are going to fit within the seven minutes that I've got to talk about the importance of music in bringing about social changes. But uh, I want to make it a, a clear statement in the very beginning that many of the ideas that has been expressed this morning here about how music can build bridges between people, how music can change the economic situation in, in any country, especially in a countries that are just emerging from war. And how music can contribute to the healing process of our war-torn country where millions of people have been traumatized uh, during 30 years of war, especially the kids and the children who witnessed the killing of their fathers, brothers, uncle, destruction of their houses. Uh, knowing and believing in the power of music, I initiated a project in Afghanistan which is called the Revival of Afghan Music. And within this project, we've got a pilot project for the establishment of a dedicated school of music, which we use to build the ruined lives of street working kids and orphans. Uh, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not talking a lot here, I just let you to see these two video clips and after that I would be uh, happy to answer your questions. With the sound. <coughs> That's a Can we have this technician in the hall here? Yeah, moment. The beginning. Yeah, it's okay now. Can we it's okay. Increase the sound. Can you hear the sound? Afghanistan's music scene is gradually being revived after being worn down by successive periods of war and unrest. The most oppressive atmosphere was during the reign of the Taliban up until 2001. Afghanistan was deprived and Afghan kids were deprived from having access to any kind of music education and generally yeah, uh, having access to any music. Music was entirely banned. Any practice of music, listening to music, uh, making musical instrument, having a musical instrument, it was a crime. Dr. Ahmad Samas did not witness the destruction of Afghan music when the Taliban marched into town. By then, he had arrived in Australia via Russia and had become a research fellow at Melbourne's Monash University. But just knowing that almost everything back home had been reduced to ruins was heartbreaking. So, Dr. Samast made a move. When I came to Afghanistan in 19, uh, sorry, in 2007, I came with help empty-handed. The only thing was, it's the idea. Oh, this is good. This modern, state-of-the-art yeah. school is his pride and joy. Timber, glass wool, it improves the acoustic. It doesn't, sound the, uh, doesn't allow the sound to get out of the room. Plus, then the, 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 the second room. So when the, both doors are closed, no sound's going to come out, including the trumpets. 
It has taken Dr. Samast a lot of hard work to gather the support needed to change the building to its current state. He has knocked on the doors of many NGOs, governments and aid agencies. Dr. Samast and his staff have just completed the inventory of more than 450 pieces of musical instruments. These were donated by a German NGO and arrived recently. Some of the school's 150 students will learn how to play them. The others will learn traditional Afghan music instruments which have been stored in an area that's the only one of its kind in the country. 12-year-old Fikri Araba says this one called the rhubarb is the best. Lessons officially began in March, not just in music, but in math, English and literature. This is precious education in a country which has one of the lowest literacy rates in the world. Central to the project is an aim to get kids off the streets. 30 of them are currently being sponsored to be in the school. The school's first group of students will graduate in 10 years. Dr. Samast is working to ensure they have jobs afterwards, but he also has a very simple wish. The national anthem of Afghanistan has been performed outside Afghanistan in Germany and sent in a CD to Afghanistan. So I want Afghanistan to have its own orchestra, national orchestra, brass bands capable of performing uh, with high quality the national anthem of the country and also any piece of music that has been played somewhere else. By then he has great hopes the glory days of Afghanistan's music scene would have made a comeback. Again, the sound is gone. What's wrong with the sound that we can't imagine? I think there's something wrong here because the text is gone. I don't know what's happening. Excuse me, can we fix that issue? Because otherwise it doesn't make any value just to put it without the text. It's one and a half minute, can we? <coughs> There's no sound, there's two kinds of sound here. What's the background and the top? The text is not heard. Maybe we can try it. Sorry? Maybe yeah, we can, can we try it. Try it again? Yeah. No, the, the background text is not there. I don't know why it's not coming. The streets selling chewing gum for a yeah. dollar a day. 
watching proudly in the background the Australian academic who's helped to turn her life around. Just learning musical instruments and what learning music. music. Yeah. That is a revolution for this country. It is Afghanistan's only music institute, with half the places reserved. This something wrong with the cable, and it's yeah, it's there. Can we put the song there? This one is on. Is it up? Yes. Yeah. Not this one. Yeah. Uh, can you hear the bell? Double click there. No, no. It's just to one make it to. Until a few months ago, 14-year-old Sanam had never held a violin. Her life was on the streets, selling chewing gum for a dollar a day. Watching proudly in the background, the Australian academic who's helped to turn her life around. Just learning musical instruments and learning music. This is a revolution for this country. Until a few months ago, 14-year-old Sanam had never held a violin. Her life was on the streets, selling chewing gum for a dollar a day. Watching proudly in the background, the Australian academic who's helped to turn her life around. Just learning musical instruments and learning music. This is a revolution for this country. It is Afghanistan's only music institute, with half the places reserved for orphans and street children. A combination that chimes, says Arnold. I'm confident that music not only contributes to their healing process, but also music can give them a sustainable future. Under the Taliban, all music was banned. The institute was ransacked, its instruments used for firewood. But staff managed to hide the piano on which 13-year-old Ellen practices his Chopin. Self-taught, a child prodigy in the making. Mastering in six months would normally take three years. Kabul remains a menacing place for the estimated 70,000 children eking out a living on its streets. Sanam spends a total of four hours a day traveling to and from school, most of it on foot. A $30 a month grant from the Institute compensates for the loss of income from her previous life. The difference now, though, is that she can provide for her family by doing what she truly loves. In Kabul, Adrian Brown, 7 News. That's what we are doing in Afghanistan and uh, believing in the power of music. It's not just that we are providing music education or we just return the musical rights of Afghan children to them. But at the same time, uh, our institute in a regular basis is uh, performing outside the wall of uh, our institute. We have got a, a number of outreach programs. Our faculty and students are playing also in the drug rehabilitation centers. We are also hosting on a regular basis music festival and conferences to build bridges between ethnically divided ethnic group of Afghanistan. And uh, also to enable Afghan musicians and also to enable these young kids to communicate to the outside world, we initiated a, another program which is an annual program, it's a kind of, it's a music festival combining education and performances, which is called Afghanistan Winter Music Academy, and through this program we're also aiming to build bridges between Afghanistan and to create a positive picture of Afghanistan and to show the, to the world that something positive is also happening in Afghanistan at the same time. Bringing international musicians from all over the world, it's a kind of, facilitating dialogue between Afghanistan and international community. So uh, if we keep going there, we need at least half an hour to talk about all the initiative and all the programs that we are implementing. To conclude it in a single word, 
we in Afghanistan believe in the power of music, and we are using it actively to bring about changes, although there's not a big discussion. One issue that probably is, is being raised during this conference is to uh, raise the issue whether music is considered in many countries like in Afghanistan, is it considered that aspects of music? The power of music is always ignored, the economic power of music. It's always ignored. The medical or the healing power of music is always in, uh, ignored. In developing, in developing countries, especially in a country like Afghanistan, maybe Pakistan or uh, India or Iran, uh, music is mainly considered as a mean of entertainment or as a type of art. So I think it's now time that in this, those countries we also get involved in an active uh, advocacy and uh, in a kind of propaganda or enlightening people about other power of music and other aspects of music. That's what we are doing in Afghanistan and constantly when there is an opportunity where we are raising that issue with politicians as well as within the community. Thank you very much. I also apologize for the technical problem that we had that practically ruined my <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Yes, technology and market is something <laughs> beyond human abilities. <laughs> but thank you so much, Ahmad. It was really impressive. And now two questions. Yes, please. Yeah. This is an extremely inspiring talk. I am Franco Cherry from the American Music Center in the United States in New York City. And I'm so curious about you rebuilding this center with instruments that have been destroyed. Are you also preserving recordings of traditional Afghan music and helping musicians tour internationally? Uh, yes, and uh, we're not only preserving Afghan traditional instruments and Afghan music. I'm very glad to announce from here that we managed to establish a wonderful recording studio, we, very contemporary with all facilities. And we've got a project within our institutions to record Afghan folk musicians, Afghan uh, uh, from various parts of Afghanistan. And this October, on the 21st of October, we also sponsoring uh, in uh, the first uh, conference and festival on Afghan music and part of our contribution to this uh, uh, festival is to record uh, the aging Afghan musician. For some instrument we've got only one or two musicians left. And it's our job to make sure that we record as much as we can do the arts in order to pass it to the next generations. And of course, we are working also in a very close collaboration with Radio, Radio Afghanistan. And I'm very pleased that also announced from here that we managed to get a copy of the music archive of Afghanistan for our institute for academic and educational purposes. Yes, thank you. It's on. Well, anyway, I can be heard without the microphone. Uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering what the Taliban had against music. Uh, of course, music can be used for cheap entertainment, but it's also the language of the soul. Uh, the Taliban could have promoted this as the language of the soul and the spirit, uh, rather than just entertainment. I think that the Taliban were a very narrowly educated people of Afghanistan, and they had a very narrow interpretation of Islamic discussion that, that you can't find anywhere in Quran, which is the main guidelines for the Muslims, anything against music. The entire discrimination against music and musician has been based on a very narrow interpretation of Islam, but because since 10th century, there's been always this discussion has been going between uh, religious scholars or Muslim scholars where the music is prohibited based on Islamic teaching or it is allowed. That discussion has been going all the way. So what Taliban did, they just joined the conservative 
uh, scholars with a very narrow interpretation of those Islamic uh, discussion that has been going for centuries. But of course, uh, the Taliban also, the, although they did not admit the power of music and did not acknowledge the power of music, but they've been using music also for uh, uh, promoting their own ideas and also to inspire their soldiers in the battlefield. They banned uh, accompanied singing, but at the same time they've been actively promoting chanting, uh, unaccompanied chanting, which was based on the well-known popular song of Afghanistan with a new text, patriotic text or religious text to promote their own soldiers. We take rest uh, <coughs> of the questions in the end. Teachers that you saw in this uh, two video clips, they've been employed uh, by our institute. We have a modest funding from the World Bank which allowed us to establish the infrastructure and also given the lack of capacity for uh, teaching of Western music and Western musical instruments, we have to, for some time, to be dependent on the uh, expertise of international music teachers. We are very much interested because everyone here in this uh, uh, events clearly uh, going to join me that to produce musicians and music educators, we need times. It's not like other aspects of development that we can bring in uh, expertise from abroad for say for three weeks or three months, and within three months, the all the job will be ended over to those people. We are very much interested in training the trainers if anyone from this hall gonna help us with this aspect. And at the same time, we strongly believe that the future of music pedagogy and music education in Afghanistan will be on the shoulder of our students. And for this purpose, we also included in the teacher training program of our institution uh, all the students that we inherited from the School of Fine Arts. And the foreign teachers who are working in Afghanistan, they are not just training our, our students or teaching our students. Also, they are involved in the training of the trainer. And all the subjects are co-taught. Co so every, in every class, we've got two teachers. One is an expert from abroad, accompanied by the local teachers or uh, and all the students in order to learn how to teach and how to maintain those programs when we're running out of funding and that there's not, uh, and we cannot ex uh, depend or uh, operate on the assistance of the, those expertise. So we are working on those direction and um, uh, we had a very uh, thorough discussion last year with the Royal Academy of Denmark, and we will be continuing this discussion against, and we are working also in exchange program with, uh, with the Royal Academy, yes, and at the same time, we also signed a memorandum of understanding with NEC, uh, New England Conservatory of America, also to get their assistance in teacher training. Thank you, sorry to interrupt, but we have four <laughs> speakers left, so the next one is Reem Kassem. Uh, please, Grim. Floor is yours. <laughs> she has graduated from the German High Business Compartment School for Economy and Languages, and then completed uh, B.Sc. Uh, in Accounting from the Ang Ang English Faculty of Commerce. And uh, she joined for some years ago the Arts Center of the Biblioteca Alexandrina, and is currently occupying the position of head of performing arts programming unit. She's also founder and artistic director of Agora Arts and Culture Organization. So please read the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's working? Yeah, it's working, okay. Uh, I come from Egypt. 
uh, and I live in Alexandria, uh, a city with 8 million inhabitants. And uh, I'm going to uh, tell a little story without a presentation and without any audiovisual material. Um, first, I would like to tell you um, some uh, brief information about uh, uh, the situation in my country and in my city, and uh, a little bit about the absence of a well-defined cultural policy in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, in Alexandria, we have 34 closed theaters, um, very old, very nice, but closed and unused. And we have only three uh, theaters that are functioning. Uh, one of them is only promoting high-profile artists, and the other two are uh, promoting young artists, but very. Uh, one of them is only giving uh, concerts on Fridays, and the other one is giving three or four concerts per month. And um, this can let you imagine uh, the absence of uh, music and cultural scene in the country, uh, in, in a city with eight million inhabitants. A few years ago, uh, there has uh, um, an independent scene has emerged emerged in the in the country. Uh, young people who love music but did not have any musical education uh, started doing music based on uh, their own knowledge and based on informal workshops with people who know music and who have learned music. And uh, in 2006, uh, more than 20 uh, music bands uh, have been emerging and have started performing in Alexandria. And those bands have uh, identified the need of an alternative music scene other than the commercial one which everyone knows about. And started writing songs, uh, composing songs that discuss uh, social problems such as unemployment, uh, uh, traffic problems, and lots of other social problems. And then, uh, one year ago, um, a famous film uh, producer have uh, thought of making a film about how artists, musicians in Alexandria are struggling to perform on the streets, facing problems with the government and uh, the issue of uh, uh, um, prohibiting uh, uh, public space performances and collective ga gatherings in general. And this film uh, was telling the story of uh, young artists and young musicians who want to make a festival on the street, but they are not allowed. And at the end of the film, they have written, they have painted graffiti on the street saying, let's do a revolution, we cannot do our arts. And this movie was on theaters on the 27th of January, which was in, in the very heart of the revolution in Egypt. And of course, no one had the time and uh, the mood to see this movie, but it was uh, screened uh, in lots of other countries, and now we are calling for uh, uh, bringing it in on theaters again. I was very lucky because uh, my husband is, is a musician, and he was one of the band members who did this movie, and I have attended lots of, uh, uh, lots of the their the screening and how they were taking the movie and really how they were facing even problems with the government to the, get permissions to shoot on the streets. And then on the 25th of January, the revolution happened and all the musicians went out to the streets and started doing music during the protesting. Even in the Tahrir Square, there were five stages for musicians and uh, poet, poets uh, who are saying songs about uh, changing the behavior of the youth, changing the behavior of the country, calling for positive social change, and so on. And because of this, in February, I have initiated a festival start, uh, titled Start With Yourself, Towards Positive Social Change. And this festival, uh, one of its features is to be uh, organized in a public space where everyone can have access to this festival, not only uh, people who uh, are capable to go to a theater or uh, people who are aware that um, arts is something important. 
And we did this festival in, on the 24th of February, two weeks from the revolution. Uh, the end, uh, not the end, the stepping down of the president. And at that time, it was very difficult to get any permission to do anything on the street. It, the, yes, there was no government, and yes, no one could say no, because everyone was, was already on the street. But it was very dangerous because the prisoners were out and they were causing trouble everywhere. But we, had, we were very lucky also to convince the army that they should come and secure a festival of arts. Of course, the, phone, the first phone call with the, with the army was very difficult, and the man on the phone, he told me, you are crazy. Uh, we are facing a future of a country which is falling, and we are not able to even uh, secure the people in their homes and uh, provide security for, for 84 million people, and you want us to come and secure a garden where you want to dance and sing? <laughs> of course not. But then I insisted to call again and again and again, and I told him, please give me a chance and meet me. I can convince you that what I'm doing is really something important. And I met this the man, of course, on the street because he didn't want me to go in the, the army camp because it's not allowed. And uh, I had a short chat with him. I gave him the letter. And um, I told him, anyway, if you're not going to secure, we are going to do the festival, because now everyone is on the street and you cannot tell us no. But it would be better if you come and uh, make sure that no trouble happens. And yes, they came, and they sent eight tanks to secure the garden. <laughs> Uh, because they were very afraid that anyone would uh, be injured or something something bad happened. And the festival was very successful and uh, it was attended by more than 8,000 uh, attendees. And we featured in that festival those bands who were active in the Tahrir Square and who, who uh, composed songs made especially for and before the revolution. And now we are preparing for the second edition. It's going to be on a public beach in Alexandria right after I return on the 7th of October. Uh, this was the little story of uh, the music. And uh, I will say something else now about our programs. Because of this and because of this festival, everyone asked me, uh, what is Agora? Agora is the organization that I'm representing here, and it is uh, my own organization. I have created it uh, after this festival in February. However, it was a movement uh, one year ago, and Agora means the gathering space uh, in the Greek language, and it is a very, uh, f not famous, but it's a very important concept in our history, in the Alexandrian history, because it played a core, core role in our uh, uh, in the in in the yes in the Greek uh, in our Greek time, uh, long 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 time ago, and uh, this movement was calling for uh, sp uh, street arts, and public space performances and self-expression in public, and. Uh, we could not uh, have any events before the revolution in public spaces because we were not allowed, but we were pushing for that. And uh, since, and as soon as the, the revolution happened, we went out and we had our first festival. But when people started asking, what is Agora, who is pro uh, uh, organizing this, and who is behind all this, we felt that there is a need for registration and a need for having a legal entity. And we registered in July, and uh, now we have three main programs, Arts for Social Change, Arts for Economic Development, and Arts for Environmental Awareness. And uh, under the first program, Arts for Social Change, we have two projects. This festival, Start With Yourself, and uh, the title of our next edition in one week is Dream, Achieve, Change, Start With Yourself. And the second project is Explore the Arts. And this is a very important project in my point of view because it's calling for uh, introducing music and arts in general in governmental schools. Because uh, we have identified the need for the children to practice arts, uh, not only because it uh, it gives them a space venue to express themselves, but also it gives them skills that are very important for, for their educational life. Without 
uh, reflection skills, diversity skills, for example, a child cannot solve a mathematical problem and they cannot uh, um, excel in their education. And we have also identified the need for this because 30% of the Egyptian children will, will suffer from psychological distress in the future because of the happenings during the revolution. So uh, we are now calling for having uh, uh, arts part, as part of the educational curricular. Um, yes, I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, and after that we are going to, to, now we are implementing it in a French school in Alexandria and with the income of this project from the French school we are going to do it for free for, in governmental schools. Thank you. But now, two very short questions, so that we can go quickly. Yeah. I just want to ask, can we come to Alexandria? Yes. On the beach? <laughs> yes, you're more than welcome to come. When? It's 7th of October. Very near. Um, may I ask well, what's the reason behind the microphone? You have one, you have one. <laughs> <laughs> All the time, I look for the very bad luck today with the technologies. <laughs> um, may I ask what's happened or uh, what's behind that a country which built an opera house? Many, many years ago, and invited Verdi to and commissioned Verdi to an opera. What's happened that today all the opera, all the theater and concert hall are closed in Alexandria, and there's no opportunity for kids to learn music? What's behind this part of the policies of the government, or uh, lack of funding, or lack of uh, cultural policy? Yes, it is the the absence of a well-defined cultural policy. Uh, because you never know uh, what are the plans of the government they don't reveal. And uh, the second thing is also the lack of funding because those theaters need to be uh, restored. Uh, they need to buy uh, equipment, they need to restore the theaters and they don't have money or they have, but they spend it other, uh, in other uh, things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reen, so There's much. One more, or is it, there was one more oh. question. Okay. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm sure you can help me out, because I don't know the name of the writer. But there are two books which I've read which I, help, which I think help to answer that question really in a comprehensive way. They're called Whatever Happened to the Egyptians and Whatever Else Happened to the Egyptians. Uh, perhaps you can tell us the name of the author. But uh, if you get that, I think it really, especially whatever else happened to the Egyptians, it shows what happened to them. Okay. Yeah. You can Google it. Yeah, I yeah. will check. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we will go on as quickly as possible, but, but the, these presentations are so interesting. And our next speaker is Feti Skonda. Please, Feti, uh, Director of Music and Smek, Secretary General, General of the National Music Committee of Tunis. Uh, he became vice president uh, of the IMC in uh, 2009 and is also a member of the executive council of the Afro Arab Cultural Institute and dedicating his career to the preservation of classical Tunisian music. He was nominated artistic director of the Ratsidiu. I, I cannot pronounce this orchestra. <laughs> yeah, okay, but please. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my speech is about music in Tunisia between entertainment and social development. I will speak about uh, polit music, uh, polit policy during Bourguiba, Ben Ali, and during uh, the revolution, but 
in French because it's much easier for me and maybe we need this one because uh, I can't uh, give my uh, speech in, in English. <laughs> you have time to, to get your You are ready. Translation. <laughs> if you need some. The French colonization. <laughs> I have to speak. <laughs> We are maybe two or three uh, people who uh, speak French here in the <laughs> room. <laughs> Afri North Africa and... Okay. Uh, I will speak uh, slowly so they can translate. Il est communément admis que la musique adoucit les mœurs. Cette citation revient chaque fois que l'on veut souligner les valeurs de l'art musical. Mais en fait, de quelle musique s'agit-il Quelles expressions musicales peuvent répondre à cette maxime La musique joue-t-elle vraiment un rôle dans les sociétés Si la réponse est affirmative, quels seraient ces rôles euh, La communication que je vous propose, euh, plutôt que je donne là, se propose de trouver des réponses à ces questionnements à partir du cas de la Tunisie, pays où la pratique musicale occupe une place privilégiée, comme d'ailleurs dans beaucoup euh, de pays arabo-musulmans. La musique sous ses différentes expressions, c'est-à-dire classique, traditionnelle, populaire, folklorique, de variété, et autres, est en Tunisie omniprésente dans différentes circonstances. Ses fonctions, aussi multiples que variées, consistent essentiellement à stimuler les esprits, à faire rêver, à exprimer des sentiments, des, des états d'âme, etc. Son caractère divertissant n'est pas à sous-estimer. Parmi ses vertus les plus citées, sa, capa sa capacité potentielle de raffiner les goûts, d'ancrer les valeurs morales chez les citoyens. On attribue déjà à, 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 à Aristote, au IVe siècle avant Jésus-Christ, une citation par laquelle il considère qu'il est impératif d'apprendre la musique aux jeunes, car il s'agit de l'un des moyens de lui assurer une bonne conduite morale. Sur un autre registre, le philosophe et érudit musulman, euh, arabe musulman Al-Razali, XIIe siècle, considère, écoutez bien, que celui qui est insensible à la beauté du printemps et à la splendeur de ses fleurs, qui ne vibre pas au son du lutte et à la musique en général, et d'un mauvais tempérament dont il ne peut être guéri. La musique euh, contribue également à l'épanouissement de l'individu, à propager l'entente entre les communautés et les peuples de la terre, sur la base de la tolérance, de l'entraide et de la compréhension mutuelle. C'est aussi un art qui peut contribuer au progrès, au progrès économique et social des peuples. Et c'est à, à partir de toutes ces considérations que l'État tunisien a accordé une impor, importance accrue à la musique depuis l'indépendance de la Tunisie en 1956. Quelles étaient les orientations de la politique des gouvernements successifs dans la promotion de la musique, c'est la question à laquelle je vais essayer de répondre. 
sous Bourkiba, comment c'était la musique Bourkiba, figure emblématique de la lutte tunisienne pour l'accès à l'indépendance et au développement économique et social, a accordé une importance à la culture en général et à la musique en particulier. D'ailleurs, le Comité national de la musique a été créé en 1960. Il a fait beaucoup de choses, je ne vais pas les citer pour gagner du temps. Euh, euh, il a notamment généralisé l'enseignement de la musique dans toutes les écoles primaires et secondaires. Il a créé aussi euh, des instituts supérieurs de l'enseignement musical. Euh, D'ailleurs, nous avons cueilli les fruits et les gens, les personnes qui ont assisté à la dernière, dernière Assemblée Générale ont pu mesurer l'ampleur de l'activité musicale en Tunisie. Bourguiba a fait autre chose. Il a euh, créé un événement annuel pour célébrer son anniversaire. Alors comment il a fait Il a euh, incité tous les ensembles des différentes régions à venir jouer de la musique devant lui. C'était pour lui une occasion de stimuler l'activité musicale et cette action-là a poussé les chefs, les, ce qu'on appelle chez nous les gouverneurs, à s'occuper de la musique, à former. Parce que Bourguiba, lorsqu'il voyait les jeunes et les moins jeunes qui jouaient devant lui, pouvait évaluer le degré de progrès économique et social dans leurs différentes régions. Donc, il a fait ça à bon escient. Euh, Qu'en est-il maintenant sous l'ère, ce qu'on appelle l'ère nouvelle, c'est-à-dire l'ère Ben Ali La politique a pris, la politique en matière de musique, a pris une nouvelle tournure. Elle prônait l'idée que la culture aide à immuniser la société contre tous les excès générateurs de déséquilibre, d'instabilité, et comme étant la sève nourricière indispensable à toute œuvre humaine. Le discours officiel tonnait haut et fort que la pratique musicale constitue une voie dans la réalisation de la démocratie qui est antinomique avec ignorance et stérilité intellectuelle. Donc, cette politique euh, tournée autour, autour de éducation musicale, promotion de la euh, création des de, de nouvelles donc, compositions, la préservation et la mise en valeur du patrimoine euh, que, euh, que, que, musical, euh, l'encouragement des jeunes. Vous allez me dire que tout est bien dans les meilleurs des mondes avec cette politique-là. Alors, qu'est-ce qui se passe Justement, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé malgré tous ces efforts et l'argent qui a été accordé aux différents ensembles et orchestres tunisiens, il y a eu la révolution. La révolution, c'était comme une sorte de tsunami qui a renversé le régime en place en Tunisie et dont les ondes de choc en, euh, sont partis en Égypte, en Syrie, en Libye, à Oman, et j'en passe. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé eh ben, Je pense personnellement que malgré les, les efforts qui ont été consentis et que l'on voit à l'œil nu, il y avait une sorte de malaise, surtout chez les jeunes parce qu'on leur donnait les moyens, mais en même temps, on les muselait. C'est-à-dire qu'il n'y avait pas une vraie démocratie, qu'il n'y avait pas une liberté d'expression, et que la musique était orientée plutôt vers le divertissement, c'est-à-dire les pouvoirs publics, comme s'ils voulaient... Euh, euh, éloigner le peuple de leurs vrais problèmes. Envoyer les ministres rigoler lorsqu'ils voient à Carthage 
au festival de Carthage, par exemple, des milliers de personnes qui se tortuaient comme ça, à cœur joie, euh, ils disent « voilà, le peuple est content ». Mais au fait, c'était euh, ça, ça cachait comme, quand même un certain malaise social qui est dû à la perte de valeur morale euh, euh, et puis à la perte de la vraie démocratie. Je, je passe à la dernière partie de, de cette intervention. Alors, il y a eu la révolution qui s'est déclenchée en décembre 2010 et dont l'apothéose, c'était le 14 janvier 2011. À partir d'un événement vraiment banal, quelqu'un qui, qui, qui s'est fait brûler à, dans une zone défavorisée en Tunisie, ça a pris feu partout et justement, la musique a joué un rôle essentiel et capital dans ce qui s'est passé. Nous avons euh, vu euh, 20, 30 groupes de musique euh, jeune qui chantaient la révolution. J'ai vu de mes propres yeux les avocats, les juristes, les fonctionnaires de l'État qui chantaient des hymnes et des chansons que j'ai écoutées lorsque j'étais jeune, patriotiques, et qu'on n'en entendait plus. Donc, tout le monde chantait presque la même chose. Il y avait comme une solidarité entre les différentes couches sociales de la Tunisie. Et je répète que euh, la musique, surtout le, le rap, euh, a joué un rôle essentiel dans la euh, destitution du président Ben Ali qui a fui le pays. Bon, maintenant, la question qui se pose, euh, est-ce que après cette révolution, nous allons toujours continuer à croire que la musique peut con contribuer à des changements radicaux dans la société tunisienne Est-ce que le paradoxe que nous avons vécu en Tunisie entre un gouvernement qui donne beaucoup d'argent, mais le résultat était nul, en, en, en quelque sorte, qui donnait à la musique beaucoup d'argent, mais le résultat n'était pas à la mesure des attentes. Est-ce qu'on va euh, élucider ce, euh, ce problème-là Je n'ai pas de réponse à vrai dire, mais en tous les cas, mon pays passe par une période cruciale dans son histoire, et je pense que l'avenir va nous donner les réponses. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. C'était très, très intéressant. Et maintenant, deux questions, deux questions. Ah oh, oui, oui. Oui, parce que le temps passe. Mm, oui, oui. Uh, yes, we have uh, been granted extra time so that we can uh, continue until uh, one, uh, 50 minutes uh, longer. So we have a little bit more time now. Yeah. No, que no questions. Okay, we can continue. And then Arne Salover, who is a producer, educator, conductor, prize winner in world top uh, sire contest, president of Estonian uh, Choral Association, board member of IFCM, Estonian Music Council and Council of World Mr. Choir Games, founding member of the Estonian Society for, for Music Education, and its first chairman as well. Salover is the artistic director of the Estonian Song Celebrations and Open Air Concert, uni uniting a joint choir of 20,000 singers. So, uh, Arne, floor is yours. Okay. Uh, dear friends, I tried to do as quick as possible, and I was very inspired about uh, my friends who made uh,
presentation before me. I hope uh, I use my seven minutes and later if you are some interested you can look for music, uh, books, uh, contacts here in Estonia. <clears throat> but uh, uh, when there was uh, idea to to present something about music and social changing, uh, I, I start to think about uh, what is important for us Estonians. Uh, because uh, talking politically, there shouldn't exist uh, this country, independent country like Estonia. Uh, it never has planned to be so. But today you are here and we are here and we're talking in our our language, and this is strongly connected to music. So I try to very shortly go on this subject. Uh, maybe you have visited, um, if not, please visit place which is in Tallinn and called Laulu Valjak Song Celebrations uh, Open Arena, which is a special place when we do our, uh, our music and social event after two or three years and put flame into a tower uh, for marking, uh, marking uh, importance of music and connections with freedom. Um, actually, I have a one video here, but maybe I don't play our national hymn, which is uh, strongly connected to <laughs> Finland. So socially, we share music with them still. Thank you. Uh, OK, but uh, mm, uh, what we feel today is that music and education, like we, we determined, is human right. Uh, for me, it's very important because in 2005, I presented in European Music Council in competition, Many Music in Europe, idea of how we, this uh, event, can modify as a national social and musical uh, education project. And uh, it was elected to the first music forum to Los Angeles. So this idea, how to do, was presented in 2005. <coughs> idea of this was World Tree, how to connect your roots with your future. It's coming in, in many tradition uh, and folklore of the world. And uh, how it starts and what is the role of music. In uh, 1869, uh, we, we used to say that the first song celebration was 800 members in Tartu. Not far from here, where the university was uh, in 1632 uh, uh, created. And in this time, uh, process of cultural awakening, what I hear in many places here in, in around the world is, is still in a process today, was uh, started in, in Estonia. And very important that also national music composers Poets started to, to think what is the role of music and what, is, uh, what they must create. Uh, and of course, uh, to be independent, this is a basic point of creativity, and in many ways, this still exists in today's project. Uh, very, very shortly after First uh, World War, when uh, first, let's say, first republic was created, Soviet occupations come, which was quite a wild surviving cause, but still the celebrations exist, and, uh, and music of the end was giving message to be free. Many composers, people uh, who couldn't uh, express their ideas here in Estonia, uh, went to, to Western countries, for example, Arvo Pärt, who is back now again. And we, we know why, because here is the, his homeland. And then comes period in eight, uh, end of 80s where so-called singing revolutions again, yeah. And there is a movie about this. I, I hope if you are interested, please look and hear these interviews, how this process when, but what I must express, it's very important. Maybe it's something we feel that uh, we are not a big warriors and uh, to shoot uh, even enemies could be, could be maybe sometimes, 
I don't know uh, how to. I have no no English word. You, you can uh, maybe think you solve problem, but actually then you start problems. Better to better to express uh, by text and music and wait situation. Of course, we we don't think that we uh, we sing as free. I think it's uh, people who have made a huge political work about this. But to do this is best if if somebody explaining uh, your needs through the art. Uh, <clears throat> now. Uh, this event is part of UNESCO's masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. And uh, as I said, two times, two times, uh, it leads us to independence. Uh, what is 2011? This is educational cultural phenomenon which put together a state, uh, which put together music schools, a network, which put together actually parents of the small children and grandparents and young people, and jazz and pop and rock and symphony music. If you like to share the education to children, what do you do? You take 10,000 of them and you go to your friend, composer, and okay, do some music which put them sing with the symphony orchestra that the children feel good. And this is what we have made in, a, in the last two or three festivals many times. And after this, uh, a lot of young children come to saying uh, things they never has done before. Oh, can I study bassoon, for example? Before that, it, what is bassoon? Or what is symphony orchestra? But if you share them, they are invited into the process. Uh, uh, as I said, it's a huge event. Uh, every concert is um, six and more uh, hours, and it. Uh, develops choral and both instrumental music, because in 2007 we created category for youth symphony orchestras. So it's not choral event, that, uh, it, it, it was quite a choral event before. Uh, this event connects us uh, with our roots of 5,000 years old tradition of storytelling, folk songs, and contemporary music art. In the last festival, uh, actually the children created uh, their own songs, improvising uh, melodies, improvising text, sending to artistic committee, and the artistic committee put together the song which 10,000 children sang, and it was made partly by themselves. Um, okay, uh, and the input that on output, just shortly, 25,000 musicians, there is dance festival, folk dance festival, so there will be active participants more than 35, 37,000. It's cooperation between amateurs and professionals. Here in the hall is also members of National Symphony Orchestra organizers, and what we do in this place, we share our professional uh, skills with all our uh, population. Audience uh, in, in live, more than 100,000. And this is not an entertaining process. Somebody ask uh, here what it is. This is not an entertaining. It is uh, art as high, high level as everyone, depending his his age or, uh, or physical or mental power can express. TV, radio, broadcast, commission, and music, uh, and connected, you see, with many of choirs and orchestras. And uh, what I would like to express in the end of these seven minutes that uh, everything starts from folk songs. And uh, very often uh, I like to start uh, our performances with ETV Girls Choir. And this song was also part in 2004 festival, which said, wake up my heart and sing. If it's done like, uh, like you do often and we do, then everything's will be okay and social changes go positive. Thank you. Welcome to Estonia anytime but next festival in 2014. I really hope if you are interested, look for videos maybe organizations have uh, for, for different festivals. Uh, and, and here because to talk about this series this is a nonsense. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, yes. Oh, let's go.
think the, the learning lesson here is maybe the, the actually the starting point in 1869 when when the whole thing started and then where you use music where you use especially vocal traditions to express the, the, the traditional music or the ethnical music if there are different ethnic groups in the country that could that could be a best practice also in, in other countries to to consecrate one day one I know in Estonia, with, with a small geographic proximity, uh, you can get a lot of people in one place. But in other countries, you may do like the Fête de la Musique or something like that. Something that expresses the, the, the nation, the, 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 the traditions of the nation. I think which is important today is that the, 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 the new music is created, which is based on these folklore roots and and we are ready really to share this music, so the new music, which is uh, uh, young people are composing music, which is uh, putting together all these modern sounds and folklore. And I think that our publishers uh, will be share this music for you uh, today or, or in the future. Some are printed, some must be. And this is uh, just, I think, active process between all the people who are really interested. Yeah, because it's a big boiling process actually, and uh, in a in a uh, beginning uh, of the two in the end of last century, actually, there was a question for us: What is the festival? What is some kind of weapon to sing freedom? And we don't need even uh, truly says minister of the culture who was today here was uh, totally opposite uh, idea on this time, but. Uh, it's not uh, afraid to say it because our, our, it's much better if you 10 years later are more clever than you were 10 years before. <laughs> so it's not uh, any nuclear or musical or weapon or something. Culture could be only in very dif difficult times. This culture is a, is a way of the living and education is just a tool to give it from my grandfather to my grandson who's living in Tokyo. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, our last but not least speaker is Brett Piper. Uh, he is a South African festival manager, music researcher and academic, holds master degree from uh, Emory University and New York University uh, and is currently writing a doctoral dissertation on contemporary jazz culture in South Africa. Very interesting. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the honor and the opportunity. I, I thought when I heard I was on a panel that was going to speak after Yusu and Dua that I should talk for seven seconds, and I think it might, might be appropriate. So I, I prepared a paper that responds to this notion of, of fair culture at a policy level. And if someone would like to talk about that, that's great. I've got it here. But I'm going to leave that and respond to some of the things that have come up in this panel. Because I have the sense that what we'd really like to be sharing here is the interventions that are being made at the level of practice. And in fact, the, the, the point I was going to end up my, my presentation on is a quotation from one of my colleagues in South Africa who's a, a playwright. And, and I, I just want to, want to read that to you because that is the, the, the point of departure for, for what I need to say to you. And, and the point is that I think that what we're, we're articulating at the session today is that we're looking for an activism that goes beyond policy making but supports um, spaces for, for, for public artistic intervention. And my colleague Mike van Hraan in South Africa has written that while the general view is that the arts require conditions for freedom of expression, that actually literature and theater and music and film and the visual arts and so on are also means for creating and expanding such conditions. And I think this is a crucial insight, especially in places where these conditions do not exist or are under threat. And I think that what we've been hearing about today is examples of places where our quest might be less to find a, a, a policy that, that creates preconditions, but to really seek out and to amplify and foster those instances, like, like the examples my, my, my fellow panelists have been discussing, where music is already creating the preconditions for a more free and just social order.
And so with that as a point of departure, I just want to add one element to the discussion that, that hasn't yet been articulated this morning. And that is that in, in a truly transformative project, we need, of course, and appropriately to deal with, with the ways in which the oppressed of this world are excluded from musical expression. But it's also necessary for us to look at the role of music in cultures of domination. And for me, a point of departure, and I speak very autobiographically now, is that I grew up as a white South African of remote European settler ancestry and was trained in the European classical tradition. And at an early stage in my own political consciousness, I came to realize that despite this music being associated for me with, with enormous uh, lofty uh, human ideals, that at some level it had become implicated in the apartheid system. Now, the Afrikaans language is, 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 is a creolized South African language that draws largely on North European, especially Dutch roots, as well as indigenous African languages, and as well as Indonesian influences of the slaves that the Dutch took to South Africa. And this language emerged as a creole at the southern tip of Africa. And it's only in the late 19th century that the Afrikaans language was appropriated by a particular political interest group as a language of whiteness. And so although many, uh, probably the word that is most known of the Afrikaans language in the world is the word apartheid, meaning separateness, this word has in fact ha it articulates a very, a very ironic South African reality because the, word, the language itself reflects not separateness but, but the, the confluence of all kinds of cultural influences. And the festival I direct in South Africa tries to work now with the legacies of the Afrikaans language as the previous language of domination, but trying to re, re, redefine its meaning through the arts as a vehicle for creativity and empowerment and, and reconciliation. And that's a complex terrain. It means dealing with the contradictions of the ways in which cultures of domination repeat themselves uh, subconsciously for many years after a political transition has taken place. But it also means looking for the silenced voices, the historically silenced voices. For example, many people are surprised to know that almost a majority of the, of the speakers of this language in South Africa today are not of the previously racially privileged, uh, privileged categories, but are people of color. And they themselves have felt ambiguous in their space speaking this language in contemporary South Africa. In a nutshell, what we're doing in the work of my festival is to try through music to show after a really long legacy of racial capitalism in the country that, that there are shared deep cultural connections between communities that were separated according to so-called racial categories under apartheid. And music is an enormous resource in that process because it addresses people beyond the, the level of language at an emotive and in a, at, a, at a bodily level. And so we have projects at my festival that, for example, bring together folk musics of different racialized communities in South Africa, but, but the music speaks of, of, of common, common origins. And this sort of work is an ongoing process. I would invite you to, to speak with me about it, but I was really moved um, in, in hearing about the Estonian singing revolution. Uh, in many ways, the South African revolution was, was, was also a sung revolution. We are at a current moment in South Africa where the, the complexities of not dealing with the past are repeating themselves. And two weeks ago today, there was a very controversial court judgment in South Africa to say that the singing of freedom songs um, should now be regarded in some instances as hate speech because they, they include challenges to, to, to the previous apartheid regime. And, and in this context, I think doing the, the sort of work that, that we're all doing at the level of musical practice is crucial. And in many ways, the international dialogues help us to open, open up our national predicaments and see the commonalities beyond them. So thank you for the opportunity of sharing, and I continue with you after. Thank you, Brett. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really challenging for all of us, like all these presentations today. And uh, if there are a few questions to Brett, 
Yes, please. Thank you very much. I don't think we should be asked just to make questions. I think we can all contribute. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, I would like to contribute to my fellow South African over there uh, in terms of the way in which music can change a language despite a history of three centuries. Uh, he was referring to the Afrikaans language in South Africa, and I'm English-speaking uh, by birth and, and uh, my rearing, but I also had a negative attitude to Afrikaans, because we associated it with the people that imposed apartheid and, and, and upheld it. But what changed me was there was a, a concert, an ANC concert called uh, Culture in Another South Africa in Amsterdam. Yeah. And uh, Dola Brand, Abdullah Ibrahim, the great jazz performer, uh, pianist, gave an absolutely it was just a, a, a performance of a maestro. It was a, a, a masterwork. But he, he, he ended up, he played various instruments and the piano. He ended up just beating out the rhythm on his legs, singing Cape Freedom songs. Because the people of the Cape, the Afrikaans-speaking people of the Cape, the black Afrikaans-speaking people of the Cape, had joined in the 1976 uprisings, etc., and had developed freedom songs in that language. And that completely took away, you know, my prejudices and made me realize it's not the, it's not the language itself, it's what is done with the language. If it's, an, if it's used oppressively, it's oppressive. If it's used in a liberatory way, it's liberational. And it was music that did that. Thank you very much for that. I think there are that kind of examples in every nation's history, and it's very inspiring. Still, this is the last uh, question. Yes, please. Um, I'd just like to, uh, to follow up on what the previous speaker uh, said, and also uh, Brett quoting uh, a playwright from South Africa who spoke about music itself being the condition to, uh, uh, to create what art needs to operate. And, a uh, Canadian playwright named John Morell said that all great art is intended to leave us changed, which means it never leaves us. It goes on changing us. And the most significant job of art is to invoke and provoke change. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a very inspiring morning. Uh, and uh, we can see that art and music are not luxury, but a necessity for all of us. It's an every, every man's right, every, every day right. Uh, we have in Finnish national epic Kalevala a very good example. The biggest hero there, uh, Väinämöinen, uh, wins his enemies by singing and chanting them, not using any weapons, and I think this thanks for peace and thanks for culture is a very good concept. And I am also inspired of a concept artivism, art and activism. And uh, actually, I, we got a new Minister of Culture after election, and uh, actually I wrote this word to his first speech, <laughs> artivism. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank to all uh, speakers today. It has been very inspiring and challenging. And uh, thank the audience. Uh, it has been very, very active. And, and I know that you had uh, wanted to discuss so much more. So, so, so as, as I will as well. But uh, I think during this week and these days, we have time to talk about these issues together. And it, this was really inspiring. Thank you so much. Sorry for all, all the delay and, and uh, techniques and everything. So.